Uh, thank you very much, Cahir Lakan. I just want to acknowledge, thank you for letting me in because I'm not a permanent member of this committee, but I particularly wanted to come here this morning um, to hear, and I'm really glad that I did. I'm glad on two fronts. In, in hearing the, the testimonies uh, from yourself, um, Damien, and from Tracy, and from Anna as well, I think are extremely powerful. And I was actually minded at the time when I was in the Finance Committee, when the people who were impacted by tracker mortgages came in and told their real stories. And that was a real turning point in that campaign and getting the financial institutions to listen. And I hope people are listening here today. Now, also I'm heartened that all of the government representatives here today support uh, family carers' strategy. So they are representative of the government and they are saying that this must be done. So there is a commitment there that has to be followed through on, not only in terms of this budget, um, but, um, but in the long term what needs to be done. Because it's very obvious to us all that the system is broken and that there is government failure here. It's government failure, there's market failure here on, on so many different levels. We have the evidence. Often when you're tackling a problem in government, you know, you don't have sufficient evidence to be able to back up uh, what has been said. <clears throat> but we have, the, we have the economic evidence. We have the evidence on every front. So we don't need to gather any more evidence, uh, if, if, if you like, in, in terms of, of, of knowing that the system is broken and knowing what needs to be done. I think an example of the... Um, the fact that the system is broken, the people I deal with, hey, somebody I know who has autism, and every two years they come back again, have you still got it? Have you still got it? Well, I'm not a medical practitioner, but I know that when somebody has autism and in the autism spectrum, they're going to still have it. You know, it's not something that goes away overnight. So why are people wasting so much time? I also think that there's just so much wastage here. There's so much, so much money wasted across the system in, in analysing and investigating and everything else that needs to be done. A couple of things that really stood out for me was, Neve, Neve in your testimony, when you were told when, when CARES was slashed from 90 euro per week, 98 cent an hour, you shouldn't look at it like that. I think there's a message there. You shouldn't look at it like that. You know, I think we really need that to kind of really just resonates in that really it's somehow the carer's fault that they're looking at it the wrong way. It's not the system that's broken or the system that's failing them. And when Anna said, we're punished for working hard not and not abusing the system, yes, punished for working hard. And not only you, but the, your other children and your, your spouse, your partner as well, punished for working hard. And not being valued and the physical, emotional and financial strain of it. The physical and emotional strain probably can't be taken away to a great extent in but maybe the physical in terms of respite, and I have huge problems in terms of respite not being available. And in my own county in Mayo, I know even I'm at the Autism Action Group there um, a couple of weeks ago in terms of the, res the lack of residential places there. No, no respite at all. No respite uh, for people. And that is something that needs to be invested in. You know, we make choices and government make choices. We give a 9% VAT rate uh, cut to... Um, to hotels in the hospitality sector. And if you try to get a bed in Dublin tonight, you'd be charged 425 euro for a single room. And they were absolutely packed and booming. And we saw fit to give them a VAT cut of 9%. And then you look at uh, Tracy and Anna and what they're being put through. So we really need to, to examine the system um, um, there. I hear what you're saying in terms of medical cards widening the bands. I think you have evidenced that quite a, um, um, quite a lot in terms of what, what, what needs to be done. I do want to commend my own colleague, Claire, Claire Grant. She's here. She don't know I'm saying this. And Pauline Tully. But, um, you know, the charter for family carers that they compiled for us as a party, I think a lot of the things that were mentioned today are included uh, in here. Um, and, uh, and I think that goes some way towards showing the intent that we have in terms of tackling the, the issues that are there. The one question I suppose I have for you is right here, right now, in terms of the inflation, the cost of living, the price gouging, everything else that's going on. If you could maybe just explain the here and now, as bad as things were six months ago, 
financially now for family carers um, struggling, trying to get through um, the, the cost of living crisis um, that's, that, that we're living in uh, currently. Thank you very much for all of your testimonies. Thank you. Um, I don't know who wants to, to kick off there. And just to say to, to Deputy Conway Watch, I know you weren't here at the start of the meeting, um, but I did make the point at the start of the meeting. I have to say, in relation to this particular issue, I know that the Minister herself is personally committed to it. I know that from talking to members across government, uh, both in government, supporting government and across the opposition. I think this is one issue that crosses all parties and all issues. I think there's unanimity in where we want to go. I think what we now have to try and do is find a vehicle to, to actually uh, achieve that. Sorry, who, who was first to indicate? Uh, Ms. Might, Cock, Ms. I'll Cock. answer just on the, the costs there, um, because during COVID, Family Cares Ireland set up a crisis fund because so many carers were struggling financially in particular. Um, and over the two-year period, um, we've given out over €350,000 in terms of... And that's been putting food on table, oil in tanks. We bought bite-proof clothing for one mum because her daughter was biting her, because she lost all her services, all her supports, her behaviours regressed. So you, we cannot imagine how challenging COVID has been for family carers. And, you know, particularly I do think for carers of children, adults with intellectual disability and behaviours that might challenge, but right across the board for all family carers. So, they have struggled significantly. And then, as you said, increase in costs of living, the fuel allowance not being included uh, as uh, uh, in carers allowance not being included uh, for fuel allowance. So, so those pressures have been immense. We have never seen so many carers struggle financially as we have over the last two and a half years and continue to do that as we come out of COVID as well. Uh, Ms Duffy. Yeah, and I, I kind of have a very neat answer to that, Deputy, which is that um, the study that was done by the Vincentian Partnership that John and Catherine have referred to before, it was based on a basket of goods and services that were priced in March last year before the cost of living crisis. So before that crisis, that additional costs uh, facing families was €244 Euro per week. That's, that's obviously gone up, €244 Euro per week. And what's really interesting about that was... Um, that Sister Bernadette and her team in the Vincentian Partnership find that those additional costs don't only come from what the things we know, the things we've talked about today, transport, you know, household goods, all of that. But actually those additional costs are coming from families like Anna, like Neve, like Damien, who are having to pay privately for services that are meant to be public. And I, Anna, I hope you don't mind me giving your example. I don't think she will because she's given me permission before. But like Anna has just been advised by her local public health nurse to pay privately for an OT because you've no hope of getting it through the public system. So that's the advice that's been given out, you know, and I don't blame the, the PHN in that instance either. So that's actually where a lot of these costs are coming from, paying privately for what should be publicly available as well. Uh, Ms. Baudet. Yeah, I can just uh, correct Claire now because unfortunately, Esther had several choking incidents um, up to that, no one was listening to me, but when I had to, again, contact it through several, several emails, the top management of the early intervention, at that point, I was able to avail uh, one visit of the occupational therapist and a speech therapist, and they should help me because I never men mentioned that in my uh, talk before. Because Esther was NG tube fed for nearly six months, she never developed muscles on her throat and proper for chewing, so she was not able to eat. And that led me to the situation when I was desperate. And um, I, was, I was begging everybody because child was choking. So at this point, Claire, she was assessed by someone. She had had a proper sitting again, it's a long story, so I'm not going to detail, but uh, I was put to the situation that the child nearly died, and only at that point uh, I was able to get, to get this treatment. But again, it's not enough through public system. I had to go privately to the speech and language, who is who is helping me, you know, with Esther, uh, proper uh, muscle development, not only observations, how she's eating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Don. Just uh, to mention again, part of the, the wider picture, um, 
there is, we all know there's a shortage of uh, many professions within the, the health service which are making it problematic to access services. One of the responses to that from the HSE, which we're negotiating at the minute, but you can kind of understand where it's coming from, is the idea that we'll train family carers to be able to do a certain amount of this at home themselves. And like that is a constructive social cohesion or social solidarity approach. But it sits very oddly with the income support framework and the whole attitude to how we, how we value caring, that on the one hand, they're a key part now of helping to resolve a crisis. And can I say many carers are nervous and unhappy at the idea that, you know, they're going to get a three hour training session and then basically, well, you don't need an OT anymore. Clearly, we're not buying into that scenario, no, just in case it sounds like we are. But the idea that people might be able to do more at home is certainly something that should always be looked at but only in the context of a system that actually values and appreciates and doesn't make them out of pocket for doing it.